Good morning. Welcome. Glad to have you out this morning. So the day is wintry today, and then it'll be back to spring this week. So the ups and downs of Cleveland, Ohio. So no snow day, I don't think, is coming. Sorry, kids. But uh, good to have you out here today. I trust that you're doing well. Uh, as we get started this morning, I just want to uh, give to you a couple of announcements. Um, first of all, I, I first want to express my deepest condolences to uh, Mark and Brian Bowes, who attend the church here on the loss of Marion. Uh, many of us have known Marion for many years, and uh, she went peacefully in her sleep, and uh, we're very thankful for that. And uh, her funeral arrangements will be over at Davis Babcock Funeral Home. I'll be doing the service. Uh, but since the brothers are out at spring training in Arizona, they're coming back Tuesday, uh, uh, arrangements won't be completed until Wednesday. So I'll post that on to Facebook, and if you have a chance to stop by the funeral home and pay your respects, it would be greatly appreciated. So our prayers and our condolences are extended to Mark and Brian and the rest of their family. Um, I want to remind you of Easter weekend if you have it free, uh, Willoughby does a nice uh, Good Friday service at noon at the Pavilion in downtown in West Point Park. And each year, the different pastors in the area of Willoughby uh, take just a short devotional of the Stations of the Cross. And I know that uh, the weather is always kind of up and down during this time of the year. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes there's other factors, right, Dan? A couple of years ago, um, a bird got him while he was sitting <laughs> during the service. Uh, but um, you're invited out. We'd love to have you out. Uh, on Saturday, if you have a couple of moments free and you want to uh, come out at 1 o'clock, we're going to be in the gym for Easter Sunday morning, get the uh, uh, audio equipment over there as well as some chairs that are set up. On Easter Sunday morning, uh, we'll have some refreshments next door, and uh, we'd love for you to come out earlier and just enjoy some fellowship, have some Danish coffee, tea, those type of things. So we'd love to have you at 9 a.m., and then in the gym at 10 a.m., we'll have our Easter Sunday service. So that's what's coming up, and uh, it's great to um, anticipate the hope that we have in Christ each year during the Easter season, it is a continual reminder of our assurance and hope in the resurrection. I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and as we get started in our worship this morning, one of the things that we're going to see in the next couple of weeks, both today and next week, is that the disciples of Jesus had the anticipation that he was going to make himself king over the Jewish people and bring in his kingdom. Uh, they are disappointed, and as we'll see today, uh, we're going to take a look at Judas, and then next week we're going to talk about Peter. Both of them have their own form of betrayal of Jesus because Jesus did not meet their expectations. And I can understand why they have that expectation. All through the scriptures, there is a reference of a coming king that will set up a kingdom that will be for the common good of all people. So I thought I would share with you this morning just three verses real quick, and then we're going to lead into our worship time together. So in the Old Testament, Zechariah 14.9 says, And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Then you fast forward all the way to the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verse 16, it says Jesus in this uh, vision of his return and to set up a new Jerusalem upon earth. It says on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this idea of kingship is something that is anticipated all through the scripture. And even the Apostle Paul, in one of his writings, in 1 Timothy 1.17, gives this wonderful, um, glorious prayer to Jesus, and he referenced it as well. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Let's start with prayer, and then uh, the team's going to lead us in worship. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we thank you. We are thankful for the opportunity to worship you today, and we really do recognize that you are the king of all ages, you're the king of our souls and our hearts, and we come and we worship you and thank you for this time that we have to renew our faith. We pray that you'll receive honor and glory in our singing and in our prayers, and I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. King of my heart, be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. The King of my heart, be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You and I'd like for us to recite the Apostles' Creed. We do this every so often. It's an ancient worship liturgy that was used in the early church, but it's particularly relevant as we enter closer to Easter because the events that are uh, described within the Apostles' Creed really are toward the end of the life of Christ. So would you say in unison with me the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in a work of art called love. You gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart in eight billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to. Thank you so much. We haven't done that song in a while, and boy, the lyrics of it really are just kind of exquisite. Why don't you turn and greet your neighbor, and then you can be seated, please. So we continue in this series called Into the Mystic, which is a study of the Gospel of John. And we are coming to that section of the Gospel of John that concentrates on the last week of Christ's life. And last week, we saw when Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, he said, Father, my hour has come. This hour has been mentioned a couple of different times in the book. It was introduced to us when he changed the water to wine and he told his mother Mary, my hour has not yet come. But in the prayer of John 17, he says that his hour is coming. And it builds on that as we move into the last half of the book. So here's what we are looking at. We've gone through the first number of bullet points here, and we're at this point where we're talking about the stormy waters that are awaiting Jesus in the last week of his life. And not only Jesus, but those who are his followers as well, because the disciples For as devoted as they had been all their life to Jesus, or at least three years of his life, traveling with him, listening to him, watching him do miracles, and so forth, now we come to this stormy water that will test their faith and test their resilience and test their commitment. And what we will find is some will arrive safely to shore, and others do not. But as we look at this, what we see is a number of interesting characters that are introduced to us in the Gospel of John. And when you hear the word Judas, you automatically frame certain things about this individual because you probably have heard his story before. He is mentioned in all four Gospels, but what's interesting is he is not mentioned in the same way in all four Gospels. It's kind of a unique portrait, including the Gospel of John. And Judas is this individual that has this scarlet letter upon his chest as the one who has betrayed Jesus. And because of that, I have not run into too many people who have named their son Judas because of the association, right? But he was a dedicated disciple of Jesus. He's one of the ones that received the call to follow Jesus and he took up that call and he committed to the ongoing ministry in the three years that Jesus did his earthly ministry. But something happens and that's what we want to take a look at and you can see by a few references here that he's mentioned more specifically in the Gospel of John than just the individual mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where he's the individual that uh, betrayed Jesus uh, by a kiss in the garden when he brings soldiers to arrest Jesus and then take him to trial. And so what we want to understand today a little bit is how John is portraying Jesus. And as we look at him... One of the things that we're going to come away with is he's a very mysterious character in the John narrative. 
He's an individual that has kind of his own agenda, you might say. In Luke's account, the reason that he betrays Jesus, we're told, is because the devil made him do it. In Matthew's account, Matthew says he did it for the cash because he sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. In John, though, John portrays him as an individual that is encased in darkness because that's the metaphor John uses, darkness and light. And he is not able to come out of the darkness until it's too late, until he is ashamed and regrets the decision that he makes in betraying Jesus. So in John's gospel, he becomes symbolic in many ways too. Because his name, Judas, is very close to the name Judah. So it's in Judah where there is Jerusalem, where there is the temple. But Judas in his day is a common name. It's a name of valor because when the Jewish people fought at Masada during the Jewish revolution, it was the family of Judas Maccabeus that led that revolt. And so back in that day, Judas would be a great name of someone that they are hoping will lead a group of people to freedom, right? Isn't that ironic? Now in our day, we associate him with this atrocity, right? But in that day, there was this hope, there was this expectation, as there was for the Jewish people as well. There's some history behind his name. And the Christian faith was born out of a period of time when they initially met in the synagogue. And some things happen. We find that there is another Jewish revolution trying to overthrow the Roman Empire in 66 AD, and it doesn't go quite as well as under the family of Judas Maccabeus. And what we find is that some individuals had to hide out at a place called Masada for a while until they finally starved to death. And then finally the Romans come in and they destroy the temple. And in 70 AD, the Jewish people have to scatter from Jerusalem. And many of them had to make their way as far away as Ephesus in Asia Minor. And the writings of John are kind of centered around those seven churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation in Asia Minor. And it is believed that John finds his way to Ephesus and that many of the folks that were a part of the Johannine community also made their way to Ephesus. And they began to meet again in the synagogues like they did initially. Problem is, the Jewish people that were in charge of the synagogue and those cities. They didn't want to happen to them in this new location as it happened in Jerusalem. So the Johannine community was beginning to be pushed out of the synagogues and they had to find their own way and meet in new places and where they found themselves were in house churches. And what we find is there is this attitude behind the Gospel of John where the Jewish leadership that will eventually try Jesus, condemn him, and put him to death, are the people that are very subtly being condemned and embodied in a way in the person of Judas. Does that make sense? Okay. So John's gospel is very critical because what we find is there is some push against Jesus very early, really, in his ministry. So if we were to look at this picture, it is the end of the story. It's in the garden where there's this mob that is brought to arrest Jesus, and Judas is going to betray Jesus by giving him a kiss, a sign of intimacy, a sign of loyalty. But what we find is, there is this chronology, and we're not going to look at all the passages, but there is this chronology of Judas that 
we need to understand before we get to the act of betrayal. So in a couple places in the Gospels, we see he's one of the 12 disciples. Secondly, we see that he sees the miracles. He's the one that sees the raising of Lazarus. He sees the healing of the blind man. He see, sees the healing of the lepers and so forth. But in John chapter 6, when he feeds the multitude, when Jesus multiplies the bread and the fish, there is a little bit of tension that takes place. Because we're told in chapter 6 that Jesus gives a discourse or a teaching after that miracle. So after he feeds the multitude, he then says this, I am the bread of life. And some of the Jewish people began to push back on that because he talks about how he came down from heaven. So listen, chapter 6, verse 48, it says, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the next verse says this. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They take it quite literally, not symbolically. And they go, that's gross, right? What on earth is he talking about? And there is now a turning away. And what we're told in the text here is that Judas was a part of that group that began to see a little bit of hesitation about what Jesus represents and what he's teaching. And it says at the very end, verse 70 of chapter 6, it says, uh, as, as Simon Peter replies to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? In other words, the text says some were leaving. They were, you know, forsaking Jesus. And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. Interesting. And he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, was later to betray him. So as early as chapter 6, we get this little innuendo that here is one that is going to betray Jesus. So you fast forward to chapter 12, and in chapter 12, we see that Judas is the treasurer for the group. And he's been given the money box so that when they travel from village to village and they pull out money to pay for bread and food and uh, other necessities, he is the one that's in charge. But in John chapter 12, at the beginning, Mary anoints Jesus in preparation for his coming death with an expensive oil, an expensive nard that could have been sold and raise a lot of money, but she takes this and pours it upon Jesus as an act of love and devotion. And guess who has a problem with that? Judas. He says, in fact, in chapter 12, he says, this could have been sold and the money could have been given to the poor. Listen, it says this. Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It's worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Now, John says he's already has said he's a devil. <laughs> now, he's a thief. He's a keeper of the money bag, and he used to help himself to what was put in it. 
So now we have this portrait of one who is turning away from Jesus, and we see someone that's only looking out for his own interests. How can I make it worthwhile? How can I recapture the last two and a half years of my life? I'm going to help myself to some of the money. Well, we then see that Judas is going to cut a deal with the chief priests and those who are in power to betray Jesus for just the right amount of money, 30 pieces of silver. And we're told this in Matthew chapter 26, and then he begins to look for the right moment. And then we're introduced in John chapter 13 to Judas again when Jesus is in the upper room and he's having dinner with his disciples. And then he says this. It's interesting, he talks about one who's going to betray him. And in verse 18, Jesus says, I'm not referring to all of you. I know those who I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of Scripture, he who shared my bread has turned against me. And the disciples are looking around and they're going, who is he talking about? Who is he talking about? And so what happens is there is this kind of a sidebar conversation that goes on. Jesus, it says in verse 21, is troubled in spirit. Because very truly, I tell you, he says to his disciples, one of you is going to betray me. And his disciples stared at each other and were at a loss. Who is it? So finally, Peter, who is always the bodacious one, right? Asks Jesus, who is it that's going to betray you? And Jesus leans back against Peter and says, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Do you see the progression that's going on in the text? And then Jesus says to him, what you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. And it was night. Darkness. There's that image again. This battle between light and dark. And the symbolism is that Judas is an individual that is enveloped in darkness and he makes poor choices And he makes decisions because he can't see the light. And that's what John is trying to get at. So finally, in the chronology of things, in chapter 18, you have this closing scene before Jesus is taken off for trial. So Jesus has prayed. Now he's betrayed. And then he will be on trial. And then he will die. And then we find here just a a quick little bit in chapter 18. When Jesus had finished praying, he left his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley, and on the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Now, The text will go on to say in chapter 18 that uh, Peter is going to pull out a sword. He's going to try to defend Jesus. And he swipes at the head of a soldier and cuts off a soldier's ear. And Jesus will end up healing that individual. But what we're not told in the text, ironically enough, is that John does not record the kiss the kiss of betrayal. That's recorded in the other uh, gospel accounts. But this kiss of betrayal that we see in the other gospels 
is in contrast to what John is trying to do. All of us at times have kind of a Judas heart. And I think that's what John is trying to get at. We look out for ourselves. It's not just Judas that's a complicated character, it's all of us. And Judas is the one that chooses to stay in the dark rather than come into the light. I think Judas is a symbol of all those who prefer darkness to light, or those who prefer death to life, you might say. And so here in John chapter 18, we find this very interesting close to the life of Judas. We're not told about his death. That's in Matthew. And there's a mention of Judas in Acts chapter 1, where after Jesus is tried and crucified, Judas, in great remorse, goes back to the leadership and throws the, uh, the silver onto the ground and wants them to take it back. And the leaders say, no, what is done is done. And the text tells us that he goes out and he hangs himself and commits suicide. Well, in John's account, what's interesting is he doesn't mention any of that because he is still trying to portray, I think, that Judas represents something bigger. Next week, we'll see in Peter's denial of Jesus that even though Peter makes the mistake of denying Jesus three times, by the end of the book, he's restored. Jesus has forgiven him. Couldn't the same thing have happened for Judas as well? John doesn't want that, okay? John is trying to make sure you understand, and I understand that Judas did the dastardly deed, right? How about us? Well, it's interesting what happens in church history. Sometimes there is an attempt to reshape the narrative. So, there was a discovery back in the 1970s in Egypt of a manuscript. And this manuscript was titled, The Gospel of Judas. Now, it took a while for them, because it was in very bad shape, it took them a while to reconstruct it, and then finally, in 2006... It was translated into English, and you can find a public domain translation of the Gospel of Judas. There's bits and pieces that are missing where the manuscripts had holes in it and that type of thing. But what is interesting to me in this Gospel of Judas is the fact that sometimes there's another take on something. doesn't make it right, but it's an interesting take. So how many of you have ever... Uh, read any of Dan Brown's books, okay, all right? Um, Dan Brown uh, has written a number of different books, and in particular, uh, The Da Vinci Code. How many of you have ever seen the film The Da Vinci Code? There was a group of Gospels that were written that was called the Gnostic Gospels, and that's the premise of Dan Brown in The Da Vinci Code, that this extra literature suggests that Jesus got married to Mary Magdalene and had other children, and they reside in France. So anyways, the Gnostic Gospels are a number of Gospels that were not put into our Bible because it built this idea that the way to salvation is not through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but through knowledge. So gnosis means knowledge. Gnostic Gospels means there's a teaching that came about that said, you have to have this hidden and special knowledge to be able to be set free from the imprisonment of the flesh that we call our body. Now this is pretty heavy stuff, right? Not that we're going to get into Gnostic theology this morning, but here's what the take of it is. 
Gnosticism believes that matter, I don't care what it is, it can be this table or it can be our body, all matter is evil and the great objective of life is to be set free from this prison of our own body and when we do we will be absorbed into, into what's called the pleroma, the fullness of God. Now, the Gospel of Judas suggests that Judas was the only faithful disciple of Jesus. Why? Because his betrayal of Jesus caused the trial and death of Jesus, which ultimately then set Jesus free from this body, this corrupt body. So it's written rather strange, and I, I put this just so you get a feel for it, okay? Here's one of the passages. This is the secret message of judgment Jesus spoke with Judas Iscariot over a period of eight days, three days before he celebrated Passover. And when he appeared on earth, he did signs and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. Some, and then you see parentheses, they had to, to supply a word where there were some holes in the manuscripts. Some walked in the way of righteousness, but others walked in their transgression. So the 12 disciples were called. He started to tell them about the mysteries beyond the world and what would happen at the end. Often, he didn't reveal himself to his disciples, but you'd find him in the midst as a child. Then a little bit later, it goes on. Then Judas said to Jesus, how long can a person live? Jesus said, why are you amazed at the lifespans of Adam and his generation are limited in the place he received his kingdom with his ruler? Some of that doesn't make sense. That, that sentence doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So, you know, the, uh, the effort to translate is also the effort to try to understand the mindset of the writing. Judas said to Jesus, does the human spirit die? Jesus said, this is how it is. God commanded Michael to loan spirits to people so that they might serve. Then the great one commanded Gabriel to give the spirits to the great generation with no king, the spirit along with the soul. Strange. That's why some of these gospels were never collected by the early church and put in to the canon of scripture because it just but here's the point it's interesting that now Judas instead of being a villain is a victor in this gnostic gospel because the ultimate goal of life is to get out of this body but that's not what's talked about in the text we know that the resurrection of Jesus is also the prelude to our own resurrection and our hope of life everlasting. So Judas is a much more complicated character. This probably was written, the Gospel of Judas, was probably written in the 300s AD. So it's several hundred years after the time of Christ. But what has happened is they are trying to reshape the story. The gospel of Judas is a Gnostic gospel with this premise that the betrayal of Jesus was part of the divine plan to set him free from the prison of the body. So now we come to what John is trying to communicate. In the gospel of John, Judas is this character that's part of the inner circle but he had this apocalyptic expectation that Jesus was to set up, set up his kingdom and that Jesus would be king and that the Jewish people would be set free. But nothing is going right. Jesus is doing all these crazy things like allowing a woman to pour out all kinds of money upon him. So he steals. He's a thief. But more than that, he's a symbol of those who prefer death to life and darkness to light. And in the end, he betrays Jesus with a kiss. And this kiss, I think, symbolizes his own frustration with Jesus. His own frustration that Jesus didn't carry out his wishes. 
I think that's where we find ourselves sometimes, right? That God doesn't do what we want Him to do. That sometimes God works in His own way and in His own time, and as much as I pray, it doesn't seem to do much good. And so a lot of times we have this inner Judas inside of our spirit where we kind of are so disappointed with Christ that we at times think about, why do I even hold on to this any longer? Why? Why don't I just give it up? Well, what we find here in the text, I think, is Judas symbolizes a world that cannot transcend the human quest for security and certainty because that's what he wanted. He wanted certainty that Jesus was king, that he would set up his kingdom, and everything was going to turn out great. And that's all of us, really. But Judas also kind of symbolizes those who are willing to betray their closest relationship to preserve their perspective of how they think the world should work. This is how you should do it, Jesus. You should amass a great army like Judas Maccabeus did and lead this rebellion and set us free. Well, as Pope Benedict XVI said, the very name Judas raises among Christians an instinctive reaction of criticism and condemnation. However, the betrayal of Judas remains a mystery. Did he do it for money? Was it out of greed? Did he do it because he couldn't let go of the preconceived notions of how he thought God should work through his Messiah? In John's gospel, he's kind of destined to carry out this critical role within the cosmic drama. And Judas, as he is kind of demonized within our own thinking, becomes a favorite scapegoat. But in the end, I think, what we find is that Judas could have received the kiss of forgiveness rather than the kiss of betrayal. He really could have. He just made the mistake of not trusting Christ. And so he did it for money and then he throws the money back on the floor. He dies a suicide death. And they call that field where he dies the field of blood. Interesting. There's two different accounts of how he died. He hung himself in Matthew. But in Acts chapter 1 it says he fell and his in, internal organs bust open. So how do you reconcile that? Well, scholars go, well, the rope broke and he, <laughs> he fell. We don't know. But what we do know is this, at times it's easy to betray people in a variety of different ways. For John Newton, it was through the selling of slaves. For Hitler, it was the denial of the humanity of the Jewish people. For others, it's denying basic human rights, and for others, it's the selling of weapons that will kill other people for profit. For some, it is the selling of drugs that are laced with fentanyl that will eventually kill those who take it, all for the same reason, money. For some, it might be the selling out of a co-worker for the sake of advancement and increase in pay. I think the list could be endless, really, when we think about the many different ways we as human beings betray one another. But in the end... I think there is really one difference between Judas and those who follow Jesus all the way to the cross. And that difference is Peter that we'll look at next week. The individual that betrays Jesus, but in the end, here's the comforting words. Peter, do you love me? And Peter has the opportunity to say, you know that I love you. So I'm going to have you go ahead and get Corey. We're going to do a closing song. Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. That's a great song. And it's a song that reminds us that God's grace is available to all of us. But I think we have to realize that the Judas in us at times gets in the way of experiencing amazing grace. 
I'm not calling you Judas, I'm not calling me Judas, but as a symbol, I think he represents how many times we betray our own humanity and we betray the humanity of other people rather than seeing them as beloved children of God, that we are children of God, that have, has received God's amazing grace to us. So when we hear the word amazing grace, sort of like when we hear the word Judas, immediately we think of something, right? We think of amazing grace, we think of the song. And John Newton, who for many years was very profitable in the selling of slaves, comes to this moment where he steps out of the darkness and into the light. And when he it receives this full assurance of God's love for him, he pens the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Stand with me, please. And let's close our time together with Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. that's a wonderful promise. You will forever be mine. Jesus put it this way, I am the good shepherd and no one can take you out of my hands. Isn't that a great? Let's pray. Lord, as the good shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, we thank you that none of us are lost because of your amazing grace and mercy. 
Indeed, Judas teaches us a lesson of just stepping into the light and allowing your love to cover us all over again. We praise you for the eternal security that we have because of Christ, His mercy and His grace. We're thankful that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So pour out your love upon us. May we be filled to the brim with the knowledge of how much you care. Many times we don't understand your ways or your timing, but help us to stick with it to the end. Help us to be faithful because your promise is good and we rest in your goodness and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hope you have a great week, everybody.